Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special and exciting and really very posh, I'm sorry, William, you are a really posh guest, William Sitwell. Um, William, I want you, first of all, to conjure up the, the room that we're sitting in. What have we got? Well, we're sitting in the drawing room of Western Hall, which is my family home in Northamptonshire. Northamptonshire is really slap bang in the middle of England. Um, you couldn't get further from the coast, basically. Somehow we seem to get fresh fish now and again and don't quite know how. Um, we're in the middle of winter. It's quite cold, which is why I you can, can second that. <laughs> we're both you, wearing scarves. When you came in, I said you wouldn't believe that the heating's on at the moment, would you? Um, so if you hear the crackle of a fire, it's because we are trying to bring some extra heat into this room. And my big sloppy ginger Labrador is sitting at my feet by the fire. And we're in a room um, which is sort of surrounded by portraits of some of my ancestors. Um, right in front of you and above the fireplace is a very elegant lady called Susanna Jennings. And she came to live here in 1714 and... She was actually given the house as a Valentine present by her uncle. It sounds a bit dodgy. But anyway, she'd lost her husband. And so she was a widow, um, a widower with two kids um, whose portraits are either side of her, Richard and Mary. And her uncle lived in a house nearby. And he said, look, there's this little house called Western Hall. Why don't you go and live there and I'll give you the lease? So she came to live here. It was a much smaller house then. And basically the house has gone through the female line of the family ever since. Or more or less until my great-grandfather, who was called Sir George Sitwell, acquired it from an aunt in around 1900. And then it became a Sitwell house. So there are pictures in this drawing room um, of various of my ancestors. There's a portrait of a man in smart military uniform, smart red coat emblazoned with um, gold buttons. And he's looking at a map of... Uh, of Egypt. He fought Napoleon at the Battle of Alexandria. And below that portrait is a very pretty ornate fan that supposedly he was given by one of Napoleon's mistresses. Because on the eve of battle, like officers did in those days, they often dine with their enemies. And often their enemies allowed them to enjoy themselves with some of their women. No. <laughs> so... Is that... We we live in a in a an impoverished age, don't we? Where where things like that don't happen anymore. I don't think they do. Um, yeah, you don't die with your enemies. You just sort of um, you just send a drone, don't you, above them? And then below that fan, there's a rather grand pink sofa that actually was given to my great aunt, who was a poet called Dame Edith Sitwell. We might talk about her. Yeah. And Edith was often getting into sort of literary scrapes and battles um, with various of her contemporaries. She got into these huge rows. She was constantly feuding with people. And one of the people she feuded with was Noel Coward, the famous impresario, actor, yeah. writer, poet, uh, playwright. I can't, he did a lot of things. Anyway, the denouement of their argument, and it was based upon the fact that he had written a comic play in London that, basically took the piss out of the Sitwells and either didn't find it very funny. He felt awful about the fact that he'd lampooned her and her brothers. And uh, by way of apology, he gave her a sofa. So that sofa was given to my... My card. Was given to... It's, given, it's pink. It's pink. Yeah. It's pink. And then um, around this room, there's some lovely antique um, bits of furniture. There are two chests either side of the fireplace by a French artist called Langlois, an important, I think he's 18th century French cabinet maker. Then there's a piano in the in the corner, other pictures and so on. And um, over in that corner of the room, there's a, uh, it's called a zither. It's an 18th century lyre. It's, uh, it's a musical instrument. And um, it actually, it was one of the few um, pieces from this house that was returned after we were badly burgled about 15 years ago. Anyway, and then next door, there's a library, which is very much redolent of the house as it was in the early 1700s it's still exactly the same really a small room um, so this house in the early 1700s was a much smaller house a sort of uh, two-story house with a courtyard a parterre 
lawns going out into the fields and so on. But I think because the house has gone through the female line of the family for several hundred years, it does retain a charm of a kind of another era. I'm, I've, now re- I've now reached the age where, where my, my friends, my contemporaries, um, some of them, the lucky ones, are, are the sort of bosses of, of splendid houses like this. Um, but I, inside, I, I, I still feel like sort of I'm 18 or something. Do you ever, ever sort of look around and pinch yourself and think, bloody hell, I'm in charge of this? Well, I'm sort of in charge. My, my living here is kind of precarious. I'm just sort of seeing if, and if I can cling on to it. Um, uh, I, I don't have any ownership of it personally. Right. <laughs> it's sort of complicated. Are you, are you, are you a bit, is it a bit um, like the National Trust where you just it's get not, to live? It's not. It's basically amongst my siblings and my mother. We all have an equal share in it, and I'm trying to see if I can run it. It's expensive. It's expensive to heat, um, just to say the least. I mean, these vast houses, there's no insulation in the roof. Yeah. So any heat that you generate sort of disappears. Yeah, you were telling me about how much your heating bill is. Right, it's unbelievable. I mean, just the oil alone is about £500 a month, and that's it, with it just barely ticking well, over. Well, like, like now, which is yeah, pretty arctic. Yeah, it's yeah. full on. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And so I do a lot of events here and stuff. I mean, because I'm in the food world, I kind of trade on that. And I mean, tonight I've got 58 people for dinner. Yeah. I get famous chefs to come over and cook. So it's a very beautiful place. And I mean, so it has an interesting history. It's, it's my, my father used to say it's a small big house or a big small house. Yeah. Depending on your point of view. Um, and I'm hoping we can somehow keep the roof on. Um, and keep it ticking over for the next generation, but it's it is precarious existence. It's I mean it's lovely to to be here. It's also lovely not being here. Yeah, I like to sort of be away from here and think about what it is I could do commercially or otherwise to sort of run it. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, home's got to be comfortable. And if you're literally sitting in the corner of a room shivering, yeah. Um, I mean, when we were growing up, my brother and I used to say that. The only way to get warm was to basically go and sit in the car or go to the pub. Yeah, well, I think you're, you're describing the dilemma of a lot of people with houses like this because the world the world's changed, hasn't it? Everything in this room is completely unfashionable. Everything is everything <laughs> is now stripped. Yeah. Um, minimalist. You don't even have CD collections anymore. It's it's just a few sort of uh, glowing boxes in 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 various discrete corners, and and here you've got loads of stuff. Yeah. Ornamentation and, and and things, brown furniture, for example, which when, when it, even when I was in my thirties, was was reasonably expensive. Now you can't give the stuff away, can you? All this kind of Georgian furniture mm. and I mean, yeah, if you, you're a student these days, rather than going to IKEA, you should go to an auction house and yeah. you could deck out an entire house of decent chests of drawers and side tables and chairs, and cabinets, and chests. Um, and they cost next to nothing. Yeah. There's no value in them. It's quite extraordinary. I mean, it, a lot of this stuff is brown furniture, but it's sort of some of it's slightly better than that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, I mean, you you mentioned the French person that I hadn't heard of, but I'm sure I, I would have been impressed yes. if I knew, I knew my furniture. Yeah, yeah, all that. But but nevertheless, it is. There are lots of you go around when you when you go around stately homes, go visit the National Trust, which I don't anymore generally because I can't stand the National Trust because of its position on fox hunting and gays and everything else. It's just ghastly. Um, but you go around and you see the quarters that the, 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 the old family live in and it's you don't really envy them that much, do you? You're living next to a museum. Yeah. I and mean, we live in the museum here. Yeah. And I think also... There's no point having a place like this if you're just going to live in a modern annex. You might as well. But it's a very, it's a very difficult dilemma. And the dilemma I have to face is: okay, if I bring people in yeah. as a sort of revenue stream, does that then damage the house? So you could have the view where, well, we mustn't let anyone in in a particular room in case someone touches something or something gets damaged or something gets gets pinched. In which case, what's the point? Yeah. Um, and there is a sort of generation, I think, in my mother's generation, who really sort of think the best thing to do is to sort of lock everything up. Yes. Just <laughs> don't, don't use that smart china because you might break it. Yeah. So it's just locked up. You never use it, never see it. Yeah. Well, what's the point? Uh, and if you use stuff, you occasionally break it. I think one discipline of having a house like this when you do have people to stay, 
I'm, I take in paying guests. I have a whole wing that I do for Airbnb. But it does mean that you you do have to sew up rotten bits of carpet because you don't want it to, be, to look terrible. So there's a, it, it actually there's, there's a discipline to having people. So you, you can do Airbnb here? Yeah, I do Airbnb. I can put nine people up without barely noticing they're here. So really? there's another end of the house where there's a huge kitchen with an arga. And is it quite is it quite imposing and old and, and sort of It's the oldest part of the house. So do I mean do you feel you're getting the heritage experience when you come and Well, they they feel that because they're in a lovely old house, yeah. but it's it's not f- so filled with stuff. I mean there is stuff, but it's not antique. It's not ancient precious stuff. Yeah. Um I mean maybe you can walk, people might think that it is. It's not the same as in the main part of the house, but it's it's the old coach house and old kitchen, yeah. which were were the coach house and kitchen for the main house. So it's one of the oldest bits, and the old kitchen is lovely. It's nice old oak floors, big arga. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I I try and fill that. It's quite nice. We're getting we're, we're nudging towards spring here now in England, and so my Airbnb bookings are starting to come in. Oh, which really is exciting. And and do you, and do you feel uh, compelled to lay it on? You know, like like I'm I'm the lord of the manor and and <laughs> no oh. no my housekeeper who's known as Sprout. Um, because she gave me sprouts, chocolate sprouts for Christmas once. She collect, she 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 greets them. If right. I'm around, I I do. I mean, occasionally I cook for them. I I have Gee. cooked for hen nights in the dining room. Really? Yeah, yeah. Which are you? A, by the way, are you a good cook? Well, if you ask my wife that, he she would say that I never cook. I just talk about it all the time. Right. But I love cooking. I have a kind. You know, my sort of Friday night special is literally sort of, you know. Um, I quite like using a Vitamix machine to whiz up some really fresh soup. You know, if you put loads of spinach into the Vitamix yeah. and then add a bit of ginger, a bit of stock, you just whiz it up, you get this lovely, um, very vivacious green soup. And then roasted chicken with some tofu and rice potatoes, a really crunchy green salad, and a bit of cheese. Simple. Yeah, so honest, honest stuff. Well, we're going to come on later to your your role as a master chef judge so yeah so i do i cook a bit i don't cook as much as i should and i spend too much time writing and talking about it right right so i must say if i were an, uh, an american and i wanted the the english experience my god coming here for an airbnb would be a jolly good thing well i'd like to think so yeah and also while i'm busy advertising for you <laughs> can i just say your your dinner evenings i've been to one of them, I think, um, possibly two. Anyway, they they are really really good. You get you get chefs from around the country, sort of up and coming chefs, or sometimes established chefs like yeah. Richard Corrigan. You've got coming tonight, really impressive, and they cook in your house, and people sort of get to drink champagne or whatever beforehand, don't they? In your drawing room. Yeah. So what I do is I, pref- you know, Northamptonshire isn't known for its restaurants or um, anything actually. <laughs> we actually have a burgeoning food and drink scene, and I'm. A patron of North Ant's food and drink, so I not only try and um, promote what we do in this county, but I also um, so I try and help to sort of invigorate it. But we do have some cheese makers now. We've got a few wine makers, believe it or not. We've got some good cider makers, some very good ales. We have some very good local pates and some local good local ingredients. But what I do is because there's not a massive restaurant scene in this no. part of the world, um, I get famous chefs to cook here, and I do. Um, once a month up to 58 covers so I can seat 20 in the dining room I can seat about 32 in the hall and another six in in another little room and it's fun I have a very good team of crack team of local waitresses so tonight Richard Corrigan who's a very famous Irish chef is doing a sort of five course dinner paired with wine so people come in and they can walk into the drawing room in the library and we have cocktails before then we go and sit down and in the summer we all go onto the south front, which is the the sort of topiary garden on the south garden, south facing front, and uh, it's good. It's good fun, and people love it. And actually, we're all launching an innovation tonight, which is um, I've const- I've bought and constructed a, a, a drinks trolley of sort of naughty, filthy liquors, which is called HMS Carlo, named after a teetotal friend of mine who suggested it. So after dinner, this little thing with its beautiful coloured glasses will will chink and rattle through the rooms as I try and entice people 
to give me more cash for smart glasses of kummel on ice and oh, espresso it? martinis oh, yes. and strawberry m- marmalade vodkas. You've, got, you've always got to think of that, haven't you, the bottom line. How you can squeeze a few more yeah. pennies off people. And I bought a little, um, it's called an iZettle. So it's a, t- it's a touchless card machine. So that people, when they're a bit squiffy, haven't got to start handing out their cash. They just yeah. touch. So I'm constantly trying to work out s- subtle and civilised ways of rinsing people. Do you, do you find it difficult, or did you ever find it difficult, to think about money? You know, it's a really good question. That I've never really thought about money. And one of the things that I find astonishing is that, you know, I went to a pretty good school, same as you, a place called Eton College. No, I, I wasn't there. My, only my son was. It was it, yeah. yeah, yeah. of course, you just pretended <laughs> you were there. Vicariously, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just went to smart universities and pretended you were yeah. there. Um, so we were taught a lot of things, but we weren't taught about commerce and business hmm. and ever given a spreadsheet. And it's really since I got divorced a couple of years ago that I've suddenly realized that I had to make money literally to survive because I have my, you know, I have obligations and I have school fees, which is this sort of yeah. crazy English thing where we where we spend, spend an absolute fortune to, to get rid of our children. <laughs> not see our children. <laughs> not see our children for, for months on end. <laughs> for months on end. People think, people think it's cruel, don't they? <laughs> it is. It's cruel on the parents. The kids love it. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, and because I then came, because the opportunity came to live here, I realised that actually I have to start being commercial. Hmm. And I think I had some innate commercial zeal, but I've never really thought about things from that perspective. So it's been quite um, quite eye-opening for me, and I, I, I think I'm better at it than I might have thought. So, you know, I, I, I mean, the essences of some businesses is quite simple. You get something and you sell it for more. You know? yes. So and yeah. that's what I'm doing here. Um, so, uh, so there's a sort of holistic thing that I want to keep the house going, yeah. but also if I can do that and make money and fund, well, try and fund a lifestyle. I was thinking, in a way, if you can see it in terms of keeping the house going for future generations, it becomes a sort of altruistic endeavour rather than a sort of selfish one. So yes, but it is, a, it is an altruistic endeavour. I mean, I, need to, I don't know if it'll work yet. Yeah. Um, I'm just sort of hoping and praying that it does, it ticks over. But we'll see. I mean, you know, in a year or so, I was, we were sitting in a pub in London going... Well, it didn't work out, did it? No, mate, I'll tell you what. <laughs> after this after this podcast, you are going to get so inundated with Americans wanting well, to come Well, we in. love Americans. And also, the the ancestral home of George Washington... Sulgrave. ...is only up the road. And so you can go and visit the home of, of the Stars and Stripes and then come and have a tour of Western and then stay in one of the smart rooms, stay in the Needlework Room, which is this wonderful... Um, room with this tapestry bed with one of those classic English bars that are basically like a swimming pool yeah. um, which takes about four hours to fill and then you never want to leave it when you're in there and you know and I will I will wait has it got the foot. um the the plug thing which is just a, a, a sort of not not a yes it's this cylindrical cyl- device cylindrical thing that's what I want yeah, yeah. I, I remember. it doesn't work so I've had to pull it out and put a rubber thing in it William when I when I went up to you know, it's interesting you mentioned the whole Eton thing and, and um, um, sort of having a chip on one shoulder. When I went up to Oxford, I was keenly aware that I wasn't, I wasn't posh enough. You know, I, I, I wasn't Sebastian Flight. And I remember my first invitation to somebody's big house in the country and having my first bath in one of those enormous baths, which you're right, they are like swimming pools, with the cylinder instead of the plug... Um, and you just thought, this is a whole new world, um, and I'm part of this world, and isn't it exciting? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to put a couple more showers in for our American friends. I hate showers. I found a cupboard, and I've just turfed a load of sheets and blankets out of it, and we're turning it into a shower. Do you think showers are kind of horrible? I mean, they're, well, nice, they're nice, but they're horrible as well. Yeah, I, I, I like a shower. Do you? Yeah, I don't mind. After a game of squash or something. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole. My very special, and I'd say probably the poshest guest so far, actually, I'd say. And, who, and, who have you had on? Well, <laughs> who have I had on? I'm just and trying to think who. That, that's who it was, the butcher. The butcher. <laughs> Isn't that great? The butcher comes round to your house. It, yeah. 
he comes in a white van and um and a white coat comes up to the door and he has everything you might possibly wish from sausages and bacon and pork and beef and chicken and also you can step into his van you can buy fruit and veg bread it's amazing it's That's incredibly it civilized it's wonderful people if people are here at the weekend and they come on a friday yeah. they think it's some sort of flashback into the 1950s or beyond and it's incredibly civilized that's good um so i was just trying to think of, of who has been posh on the podcast we've We've had two sirs, but they're not, you know, they're, they're just Commodore Garden Knights. They're not baronets. <laughs> so we've had Sir James Macmillan right. and Sir Roger Scruton. Okay. Now, Sir Roger ought to really have his own estate and stuff, but actually he's he's lower middle class and, you know, and, and he's done very well for himself. But who... I don't think I've had anyone... No, I think you I think you are the smartest. Anyway, so this is the Dellingpole Podcast with my poshest guest so far... William Sitwell. Hey folks, I want to tell you about Breitbart News Second Amendment newsletter, Downrange with AWR Hawkins. Features the top gun stories of the week, every week, and guest columnists like Gun Owners of America's Larry Pratt or Armed American Radio's Mark Walters. Also features a review of a firearm or firearm accessory each week. The newsletter downloads on Thursday, comes right to your email inbox. You can subscribe at Breitbart.com backslash AWR. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and definitely my boss's guest so far, William Sitwell. William, um, I am a fan of a program that you are on called Master Chef. I think there are American editions as well, aren't there? But this is the the UK edition and the first edition. Um, by the way, the guy who invented MasterChef, is it was it was it Frank Rodham? It was Frank Rodham, yeah. And the first presenter was Lloyd Grossman, famously right. in the nineties. Um, they have a show in the states called Top Chef. Right. They don't do MasterChef. They have MasterChef Australia. I think there's one in India, and it's one of the original cooking competitions uh, that's basically been honed and changed over the years. But there's now about three or four formats in the UK. So there's the original format where you take amateur chefs who no one knows and they compete for the title. Then there's a professionals one, so professional chefs. Uh, there's a celebrity one, which is sort of uh, people. We sit we sit in the room as judges and these celebrities come into the room. We kind of go, who is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then there's a kid's one, Master Chef Junior. Junior Master Chef, which actually was it's my favourite. It doesn't happen every year. Right. I love it because you get these little nine, ten, eleven, twelve year olds in their little Master Chef jackets, bringing yeah. their concoctions into the judging room, and it's so sweet. And they're really good. I'll bet. They're really good. It's yeah. great. Horrible little tykes <laughs> <laughs> with their <laughs> precocious little. <laughs> yeah. So I've done that show for about ten or eleven years now. Right. And I'm one of a band of critics, and they're sort of spreading. Uh, spreading the talent now so there's a few more of us which means I think I'm on a, a little bit less so you're, you're disadvantaged by the fact that you're not female number one <laughs> um, and, and you're not ethnic either so um, well there's another posh git called Tom Parker Bowles who's a great friend of mine I like Tom and Tom is great Tom Tom, who's fantastic and brilliant and clever and funny and uh, he goes on the show as well I'm not sure how much room there is for two posh twats. If if Tom was on this podcast, would he count as posher than you? I don't think a Parker Bowles beats a sit well. No, they're pretty middle quintile, aren't they, really? Yeah. I mean, they just married into monarchy. Ex ex exactly. <laughs> I mean, he went to school, as you call it. But he's Joke, not... No one calls it school. They, you all no do. No one has ever said that. You all call we it go, school. No, you don't. You know, I've never heard anyone say, did you go to school? No, 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 you don't. No, you don't. That's not anyway, the point. No, you go. No, I've never heard this expression of describing Eton College as school. No, listen. It doesn't happen. You just refer to it on passant as school. And no, everyone, you don't. Yes, you do. Well, the, well at school, we did this. But as, as would anyone yeah, go to school. Yeah, but there's a hidden capital S. No, I've never heard of that before. Well, I have heard, but only kind of <laughs> by chippy people like you. <laughs> So anyway, Tom Parker Bowles is one of your um, is your fellow posher guests, and you've got you've got actually 
can I be rude about some of your fellow guests? No, I'm not going to because um, the people I'm on with traditionally are Jay Rayner, yeah, who is a food critic for the Observer, Observer. and Tracy McLeod, who has been a food critic and is also an agent, and and we're the sort of three long-standing critics. And what about the fat one? Um, he's he, I quite like him. The fat grumpy. Well, um, that's Charles Campion used to Just, do it. Yeah, he's he lovely. Gone? He's gone. He doesn't do it anymore. No. Um, okay. But um, and I mean, you I you don't I don't I mean, who knows if I'll be you know you, we sit around waiting to be invited to the next onto the next series. So I don't. It's, do you feel that you have a have a kind of persona that you need to project? Do you know it's funny? Some people go, oh yeah, you're that nasty guy. You're like the Simon Cowell. And then some people go, oh yeah, you're the really nice one. So I have no idea. I just try and call it as it is. And I've tried. In the early days, you know, you're in the car and you're cycling to the, the studio and you sort of think of some hilarious line, some brilliantly crafted, witty epithet. Well, before you've even seen the food. Yeah. And then you try and use it and it completely falls flat. So all I all I know is that you have to say what you think about a dish and hope that you're, you're able to uh, command the English language and describe something in a particular way that might be entertaining. And it can be cutting or can be praiseworthy. So you just have to call it as it is. And sometimes you find um, interesting words coming out to describe something that's that that people might like and find funny. Um, the key thing for us is, from experience, the longer you talk, and the flat, however brilliantly flowering, clever, if your sentence is more than about eighteen seconds, you won't make the edit. So my key thing is to always beat Jay Rayner onto the edit to save the British public from having to listen to his florid crap. <laughs> so he'll kind of go off on a tangent yeah. using all his phenomenal knowledge of food yeah, um, to condense something maybe. Yeah. And I'll just say, well, that's the most disgusting steak I've ever eaten. And you yeah. know that I'll make, not only will I make the edit, but I'll also make the pre-roll yes. advert for the show. <laughs> yeah. No, Laconic is good. And actually it does suit the, suit the so, image. Um, I don't cultivate any image. Um, no, it's just there, man. But you are a brand. I mean, we all have to think in terms of brand, whether you like it or not. Even though you're too grand to have a brand, yeah, you are too grand for a brand. <laughs> you are, you are that thing. But no, I think you come across actually. I, I, I'm not going to blow smoke at your eyes. I, I, I think you come across as as very fair and very reasonable, and with a sort of a hidden sensitive side I think comes right. beneath well, that sort of cold aristocratic exterior well there you are you, you, you painted a picture but, but um, do you you presumably don't do takes do you uh, no you film it and I remember in the old days when they used to just have one camera if Jay and I were having an argument we'd have to redo it um, so that you could move the camera to each person so we'd have to say our lines again Awesome. Um, but now uh, there, there's two cameras, so if if we're disputing a dish, yeah, um, they tend to have that, so you don't have to do the pickups. We still occasionally have to do the kind of, can you do that look again? Because we had the camera on the food, so you kind of, st you, I give that oh, look of hard. complete and utter incredulity that Jay Rayner could have said something quite so banal or stupid, yeah, or, or he, do, he he does the same thing to me, yeah. And quite, quite often there's a, there's a scene; it's almost become a, a trope. Where, where the chef comes in late and flustered and really apologetic and yeah. almost dropping their dishes. Yeah. Well, this is always very funny because we shoot uh, what's probably half an hour of TV in four hours, and um, it can kind of start after breakfast and end around lunchtime, or start at lunchtime and end around tea time. So we have to be quite careful that we haven't sort of eaten too much before, yeah. and you have to be careful not to eat too much right at the beginning so that you're, you're you're not unfair to the people at the end yeah. but the point is that we sit there eating we might have a glass of wine we're chatting we have no idea if someone's late or not and so the director will come in and say look the next chef's a bit late can you do the kind of where the hell is he look <laughs> so we stop talking we look at our watches we stare at the door we kind of roll our eyes and uh, we imagine tumbleweed you know flowing through the set but in reality, we've got no idea. That <laughs> you just don't care. <laughs> we don't care. We go, really, where, which dish are we on to now? And you, I think one of your pet hates, you don't like overworked, over sort of fancy, try-hard try food. 
well, I don't know who does really, and I don't like square plates, which will go on my tombstone because I've sort of endlessly campaigned against square plates. That and Morris dancing, really, which I think think should be banned. And the square plate and the over fussy food and the smears and the froths and the foams, the decoration where it feels that the chef has spent more time with his fingers fiddling around with the placement of the food than just cooking singular ingredients. And Michael Winner, the great film director and critic, used to say, very sensibly, I thought that uh, we don't care how many ingredients go into the dish. It's, does it taste nice? If it's 15, I don't care. You know, so that's the point, that it does it taste good. I'm not interested in the, the priest, the backstory. Yeah. And if you're over fussy and over layering and creating towers of things on on slate, um, I think it's off putting because it's just it's going to go in your mouth and it's texture and flavor. I mean, the eye does judge, but I think you don't want to be led astray by some fancy artistry. I mean, it's obvious when a chef can get it right. Yeah, um, because there are flourishes that feel natural. But when it's over, sort of overdone and I just find these sort of sometimes you get a dish where it looks like a snail has been lobbed onto your plate and has skidded to a halt and has kind of uh, there's a sort of trail of green what is sauce behind him as he's sort of crashed into the venison or something you know and you it just looks like it's over fussy I can't bear that do you notice a qualitative dis- difference between the kind of stuff that the professionals cook and the kind of stuff that the enthusiastic animals well I often find actually we often find I think that the uh, we often find that it's, the professionals are disappointing because they're trying to aspire to something and we, we don't quite know what it is yeah. whereas the amateurs cook food that is the best sort of food you might want to cook at home which is the food that most of us want to eat so I find the amateurs surprise you with how good they are yeah. and sometimes the pre- professionals surprise you with how terrible they are has has food been going through a what are the, what are the trends at the moment that are good and what are the trends that are bad well i mean i write about food trends in the times sort of every season right and because i write it i know what, i know what complete nonsense it is right because a trend is just a trend because you say it is green bowl of you can yeah, yeah you can say that uh, blue cauliflower is in and you can say that i mean i think but having said that, there are genuine things that are happening right now, particularly in London. So there is a, so whereas once the idea of eating eating vegan was literally a sort of thing that hippies did, yeah, in the seventies um, when they weren't growing their hair, yeah, uh, it is a thing now, and it is much more of a normal thing. And there are vegan restaurants. There's a plethora of vegan cookbooks, and I see them because they've been they land on my desk. Um, there are products that support that nowadays. Um, and alongside that, there's a sort of anti-alcohol millennial um, desire to drink things that won't get you drunk, which I always find bizarre. They're called straight edges. Well, yeah, there's seed lip, for example, which is distilled um, water. <laughs> it's a real emperor's new clothes stuff. But it's, it's, so it's, it's a drink where you put botanicals in it yeah. and you've distilled it. So it's a spirit, but it's non-alcoholic. Right. And Diageo have bought a minority stake in that company. There are there are products like Aquafaba, which is um, which enables vegans to make meringues and mayonnaise without eggs. It means you can make a whiskey sour without an egg. So there's lots of these things, and there are you know new vegan products coming to the market. So that vegan veganism is a thing and is interesting. Can we um, stamp on it? <laughs> How? How can we crush this, crush yeah, this well, revolt before it's... Well, I don't mind it. It doesn't bother me. And, I mean, I think anything that persuades people to eat less beef and eat, or eat better beef uh, on rare occasions is good. We eat far too much meat. There is a real problem, I think, with the amount of soil that's being used to create feed for animals and the fact that um, developing, the developing world, apes... Um, the Western world and the United States in that freedom and richness should be uh, exemplified by eating beef. It's a, com- it's a complete disaster because the amount of grain and, and water you need. So the sooner we can grow meat products in the lab so that a burger costs 50p, not £25,000, the better. I think that is in- it, it, I, it's so important that 
you're never going to convince i don't think the western world to eat insects because even though insects are crustacea of the land yeah there's nothing different between a prawn and a lobster and a grasshopper really it gives us the well, creeps the, the claws you, not not as juicy yeah well exactly <laughs> but and they're a bit smaller yeah but um i think most people don't care what's in their burger generally speaking but if you can put half a burger made of grasshoppers but the great thing about insects is that they can they can live off food waste it's incredibly sustainable and you can then flavor it with sauces so people don't know so um i think in terms of a trend that's very worrying the amount of beef we're eating so veganism and vegetarianism is a great counter to that so right. you might want to stamp it out but actually i think it's really important well i just think that um if you don't eat enough protein there's certainly with me i get kind of yes but there's plenty of good protein in pulses um so there's plenty of good protein yeah you know, I, like, and... I like lentils with protein <laughs> with, meat, with meat protein yeah yeah i just think good meat less often yeah yeah i get well i, I nothing's I... going to convince me though that that a, uh, a, a piece of meat grown in a lab is as good as a proper massive great haunch of beef dripping in fat well, this is the problem isn't it i was talking about this with um my wife the other day about fish and we were saying the problem with fish is that the best fish basically aspires to being meat so that so that even the best best the best fish is never going to be as good as the best the best bit of meat but yeah sure the worst worst bit of meat is going to be not as good as the best fish but fish is always you choose it at a restaurant and then afterwards you think why did i order that why didn't i just order a big <laughs> bloody chunk of you know what i like doing is quitting things occasionally so oh, yeah. if i give up meat it really makes me think about fish and how beautiful fish is and how beautiful fish can be and so there's no comparison i haven't drunk since the beginning of january and uh, actually that's miserable <laughs> i was gonna say that's why that's why you're talking about eating grasshoppers it's driving you bloody mad yeah, I kind of make, I, I'll make a tonic, a fake gin and tonic. Um, but uh, it's easy in my world to drink way too much. I can, I can, I can see that. I Everywhere can see. I go, people want to give me a tasting menu with with wine pairings. Yeah. You, and I, yeah, you know, oh my God, really? Can I just have one course and some fizzy water? And they look at me and go, what, really? I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm such a disappointment. You, 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 you probably have been completely ruined. Because I imagine there are a lot of places that you can just go into and they'll just give it you free. It is a perk of my job. I've no idea really what it costs to eat in a restaurant in London. No, that is <laughs> Even, I used to do, I was very briefly a restaurant critic. And even reviewing a rest, doing one restaurant review a week, I found it a kind of imposition on my time and a pain in the ass mm. ultimately. That you, you have to, you want to stay in at home watching TV and then you, you can't because you've got to go out and review food it becomes uh, everything food, becomes food, a chore. Food, I, I mean, food criticism is, is food criticism done well. It's very difficult, and there are a few people who do it well, and all the bloggers think they're all at it now. But actually, it's a very hard art, I think. And once it just turns into a, a slagging sport, it's pointless. But describing a place and the food in a way that is fair and not just sort of uh, relentlessly pejorative, is very hard. So um, I admire any good restaurant critic, and I wouldn't count myself as one of them. Well, it's why they end up talking about themselves and their companions and, and, yeah. and things nothing to do with the restaurant. Because it's otherwise... really hard. I mean, uh, describing a mediocre meal is very, very difficult. Yeah. It's really hard. So you have to go off on a tangent and talk about your girlfriend or something. I've got to tell you about, briefly... I was home alone with my daughter the other night, um, who's, a, who's a teenager and is, is going through the phase where I'm kind of pretty shit, you know, I'm just like the most embarrassing man in the world and God, are you really my father? No, you're not. Um, but I called her on, on, a, on, a, on a good evening. We decided to cook together, have a father-daughter cooking experience. And we cooked a recipe, she chose a recipe out of Diana Henry, who's one of my favourite cookery writers because the thing about diana is that she always lays on she goes the extra mile on the flavor you, you, where you you or i might might be cooking this thing and 
this is delicious enough. She goes, no, I want to make this 10 times more delicious yet. I'm going to add this thing. So we cooked what turned out to be her favourite dinner party re uh, recipe from when she was younger, which was um, lentils, you know, um, with a, cooked in the sort of conventional way on a, you know, with, with um, carrot and onion and um, celery. Um, pan pan fried breast of chicken with a wild mushroom and cream sauce. Now that's a very old school recipe, isn't it? It's a, you, you wouldn't get that being done now. It's 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 too rich and too. Uh, yeah, it sounds very nice. No, it was very good. We were both congratulating ourselves on on our good fortune <laughs> of having cooked this amazingly. But I was thinking that 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 seems to that belongs to another era. I don't think people would expect when they went to dinner now they wouldn't get that that dish. I don't know. I think people are cooking all sorts of things. I think I don't know whether the British middle class is still um, drizzling pomegranate molasses or on everything as directed by Yota Motolenghi. Oh, was that? Yeah, actually, Ostolenghi is a thing, isn't, isn't he? Or was it was a thing? Yeah, I mean, everybody in Middle England had um, Jerusalem and his other books in their kitchens. Yeah. I think people got rather fed up of another dinner party with a dish covered with medjool dates and pomegranates. And <laughs> Yes, you're right, Ostolenghi, yeah. Um, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special and gastronomic guest, William Sitwell. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. No matter what the story of the day is, I am going to make sure that we talk about these issues. I am going to make sure that when apologies are necessary, we're going to be there with a camera and with a spotlight. Somebody on this side of the aisle is there to say the movement, it was wrong. There are valid things that are happening in your city that actually need our attention. Sunny's Corner, Saturday at 1 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pole, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pole. Welcome back to the Delling Pole podcast with our very posh and gastronomic guest, William Sitwell. William, besides being a kind of a businessman, um, you are kind of a businessman, aren't you? Um, I, I won't. No, but it's fine. I do businessy things. Yeah, you do businessy things. That's yeah. that's a bit. You're a businessman. <laughs> you 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 do contracts and things and organise yes. shit, don't you? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. But apart from that, and apart from being a TV um, celebrity, you also write really good books. And you wrote one last year on. You know, I haven't read it yet, but I but I I heard you talking about it on the on the radio, and I've read extracts from it, and it was called. Eggs or Anarchy. Eggs or Anarchy. About Lord... Well, this is the story of how an extraordinary man called Fred Wilton, Lord Wilton, Fred Britain in the Second World War. And I'd sort of heard about him, and actually it was in a book I'd written previously, and I came across him, and I was writing very briefly about rationing the Second World War. And I thought it was kind of a dull story. And I came across this man, and there was just one little extract I read from his autobiography where he talked about how he had basically sent someone to Egypt, to Cairo, to negotiate um, to buy a load of rice. And the, the bottom line of the story is that this man bought, his agent bought, 100 million tonnes of rice on the black market. And Walton wrote in his biography, in his autobiography, I neither, where he, in terms of where the rice came from, how he bought it, I'd either wish to inquire nor sought to know. In other words, it suddenly occurred to me that here was a man at the top of Whitehall preaching to Britain to absolutely not break the black market rules and regulations, yet he was doing it himself in order to feed Britain and her colonies. So I thought, well, this is interesting. There must be a bit more to this. So I pitched this to a publisher who went, yep, love it. And I thought, OK, great, I've got one anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I was lucky because then I discovered through meeting his grandson all his unpublished diaries sitting in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. I also then discovered huge amounts of private correspondence. And I discovered that Walt Walton was an extraordinary man. He was a self-made man, working class roots in Lancashire in northern England. The only member of his family could, to go to university, his grandfather literally was um, an itinerant landlord his, uh, and a saddler. Um, 
he had a entrepreneurial zeal and a natural gift for retail. So to cut a long story short, he went into the retail business and made a million. He was a millionaire about to retire in his late 50s when war broke out. And he was made Minister of Food by Neville Chamberlain. So here we have an example of a businessman without any political experience put into government. And there are some quite interesting similarities, obviously, today. What happens when a businessman goes into government? A businessman who doesn't care what people think about him goes into government. And Walton operated in politics as he did in commerce. He didn't care what people thought about him. He battled with Churchill. He battled for budget, like all the other people did, I suppose, within the cabinet. But he did extraordinary things. He used the the Chancellor, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, as a sort of private banker. He was buying futures in wheat during the war using pseudonyms. Um, he was buying food on the black market. Uh, and he was this extraordinary man. And his story is absolutely incredible. So through his diaries, through all of his private documents, and because he was a self-made man, he was so proud of his achievements that he had every single piece of press coverage kept by his secretaries at the retail company he kept. So I was able to, I went up to Scotland to an old family home and discovered these albums. And there set about me was this research. You know, I was able plate. to, I was on a plate. So I was able to look at cuttings from the Perthshire Advertiser, the Coventry Echo, um, newspaper things, little stories about him that whether, which, which were either positive and negative that I'd never been able to find that with his diary. So I was able to paint a picture of how Lord Walton, um, without him, Britain would have starved. And it's an extraordinary story. And also another amazing story, such as the fact that the entire Ministry of Food, in huge secrecy in the Second World War, decamped to a little Welsh seaside town called Colwyn Bay, um, which no one seems to know about. So it was like Bletchley Park, the coding place near Milton Keynes, that's now a tourist attraction. Um, the you know the Britain's food and drink was managed in this seaside town, and not a single bomb was dropped on it. And people in Whitehall didn't know about it. I came across missives between civil servants saying, "Where's the Ministry of Food gone? We're trying to get an answer out of them." <laughs> so civil servants didn't know. Spies, German spies, in Whitehall didn't know. And this, uh, the rationing system was run without a single computer just pen, paper, men, women, from village offices right up to the Ministry of Food and Lord Walton at the top of it. And it's an extraordinary story. So, um, yeah, I wrote this, and it's kind of, if I say so myself, it's a bit of a riveting yarn, and it's a story of a, of a man battling to feed Britain and battling to convince people of, his, of the rightness of his argument. Battling the bureaucracy, because the, the state was so bureaucratic and sclerotic and and more than my job's worth wasn't it yeah and also battling people like churchill who eschewed the ration who thought rationing was some sort of uh exercise administered by walton because he was he, he sort of behaved like goebbels as churchill once called him so i mean the letters i found from churchill reprimanding walton are absolutely hilarious because he at one point he says he didn't understand the ration he says I, I would have thought just asking someone not to have a second helping would be all we need to do. I mean, <laughs> seriously. Right. And w Wilton once went to Chequers, the Prime Minister's country home, to argue for some budget. And he was amazed by the amount of food there. You know, on the sideboard, there was sort of amazing lashings of beef and ham and fish and stuff. And it was obvious that Chequers was a, was a refuge from the ration, yeah. whereas even the royal family had to have coupons. I, and I found um, letters from junior members of staff in Churchill's office writing to junior members of staff at the Ministry of Food saying, Mr. Churchill's run out of coupons and points and can we have a little extra sugar? So part, one of my theses is that while Britain tightened its belt, Churchill loosened his. Right. D um, how close did Britain come to starvation? I think there were some very precarious moments, particularly um, during the, when the battle of the, for the Atlantic was raging, yeah. because thousands of tons of, of grain and bacon went down to the bottom of the sea. And at the beginning of the war, 
our food security, the amount of food that we had in this country um, without having to import was very low. But we had, but the, the Ministry of Food and the Ministry of Agriculture had learnt its lesson from the First World War when we really did nearly starve and some people did starve. So that there was a black book that was written up in order to try and prevent this if another conflict broke out. Um, so thanks to good administration and thanks to the ingenuity and the economy of, of cooks, women, yeah. we didn't starve and we had some luck. We had some good harvests and so on. Um, bread was never rationed, for example, which was one of Walton's things that he didn't want. He, he saw that as a, an admission of defeat. So there were times when, um, you know, ships carrying very important things were, were sunk. Um, the other thing was that dig for victory, which was not just a PR campaign to get people to grow vegetables, was actually very important. And it did revolutionise the amount of agriculture that we create in this country. I mean, the fact that the lawns in front of Buckingham Palace were sown with cauliflowers, yeah. that parks were sown with carrots and potatoes, you know, it looked good. It was a great PR did, triumph, did, but it, it made a huge difference. Did it, it really did? It actually did make a difference. So, so the, the, the amount of land under cultivation, what, 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 by what percentage did it did Well, it I can't remember the actual figures, but I mean... Our food security went from sort of forty to sort of sixty percent. I mean, right. it, it really made a big difference. And Walton was famous for his Walton pie. Which was it nice or was it horrid? Well, Walton pie was a PR stunt that was launched at the Savoy Hotel. Uh, I can't remember which year. Um, which basically showed that you can make a pie uh, using the ration that was quite a tasty pie. And it. Wherever Lord Walton meant, went, they've made this wretched pie. Oh, God. And I've been touring this book for a couple of years, and wherever I go, they go, I must have said, well, we've made you a Walton pie. And <laughs> Churchill was famous. He served it once at the Savoy, and he pushed it aside, and he went, bring me some beef. D well, well, tell me what's it like. But what's in it? It's basically veg with a, with a pastry crust. So it's your dream come true. It's your punishment for your nonsense about I've had a, I did have a very good one, but I think the... I think the uh, chef put a bit of extra butter in it. It's perfectly okay. Yeah. What else should we talk about? Uh, well, we can talk about your um, your other your other book. Yeah. Um, which is the one about the greatest Wait, a, recipes? A history of food and a hundred recipes. Yeah. What's the first one? Well, the first book I wrote was was called A History of Food and a Hundred Recipes, and I'm quite proud of that because it's been translated now into about nine different languages. Yeah. It was also translated into American, which is very helpful for our friends over there it's true it's really annoying when you're reading a book and it's spelt colour it's spelt in the wrong way regardless yes, of which side program it. yeah it's really annoying isn't it <laughs> even now even in this in this kind of multilingual world yeah but um, that was basically a, a story of the the recipes the ingredients the tools the personalities who have shaped the way we eat over various centuries and uh, it was a great book to research I spent a lot of time in the British Library in London um, pouring my way over beautiful old little tomes and discovering amazing stories um, and building up a picture of the world and and the things, the extraordinary moments in the world that have changed things and and there are there are many I mean and they're just sort of there are there are various heroes that pop up there's a man called Clarence Saunders who invented the first supermarket in the United States and it's an extraordinary story because he was a man who basically came from nothing, who, a bit like Lord Bolton, funnily enough, he got involved in retail. He was always constantly um, trying to work out better, better ways of, of uh, better economies. So, for example, you know, the early days of grocery shopping, the woman, and it was always a woman, would go to the store at lunchtime. Men in white coats would hand her stuff, stuff from the shelves. So you had a lot of staff who had not much to do most of the day but then were rushed off their feet at lunchtime and he was trying to work out a way of dealing with this and he'd heard that there was a new store format in Indiana and he went over there on a train and it was nothing the same old thing and as he was coming back home his train stopped uh, for some reason and he looked out of the window and he saw a pig farm and he spotted a mother sow feeding her eight piglets and he just he thought that's it self-service and three months later, and I'm not making this up, he, he opened Piggly Wiggly, which is still going. And it was self-service because he realized that what you should do is basically create a store format with, with where you, you know, walk down an alley 
Yeah. Walked down an aisle. Um, trying to smash yeah, the quite sorry. things. Well, you walked down a, an aisle and you picked goods off the counter you know, yourself. And so you had a bit of freedom. It enabled marketeers to market their products mm. and put more fancy product design on. And then you went to the till and you got a little receipt. And this revolutionized the way that people shot. He actually got into trouble and traders started shorting on his stock and he broke some New York stock exchange laws. I'm not quite sure why. And he went bust and bankrupt. Not before he'd built himself a pink palace clad in pink pig-inspired rendering at his home and built an un, an, a, 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 a huge bowling alley in the basement. But he went bust and then he dusted himself off and he wasn't able to trade under Piggly Wiggly anymore. So he, in huge anger, opened his new store called Clarence Saunders, sole owner of my name store, okay, which was then known as the No Name Stores, which didn't do very well. Um, then he came up with a thing called Food Electric before he died, which was, he said, he wanted to try and invent this device that would be able to read something on a package that could tell you what that package had in it. And people kind of said, well, you know, I thought he was talking garbage. But this is, of course, how people shop today. But he didn't have the technology to have sort of self-scanning. But there were people like him. There were people like um, Dennis Papa who invented the... Um, what's called a steam digester or engine for softening bones at the end of the 17th century it was basically a, an early pressure cooker. So these great innovators, right? Stories of how tomatoes came out of Mexico in the sort of early 16th century, but never really got into proper culinary practice until a lot long, a lot later. I mean, the first ever recipe using a tomato I discovered in a book called The Modern Steward, which is a book written in Neapolitan Italian in about 1680, um, a book written by a man called Antonio Latini, who was, a, who was a, a chef, a steward in Naples, Spanish, occupied Naples. And I went through this book and I finally discovered a recipe, salsa de pomodoro a la España. In other words, tomato sauce in the Spanish style. This was the first ever recipe to use a tomato. And it's taken several hundred years before after the Spanish conquistadors brought tomatoes over to Spain, along with chocolate and turkeys and other things like that. Um, so you think, you know, what were the Italians putting on their pizzas well, for indeed. all these years? What were the Provencal chefs, cooks, putting in their stews? And even in the early 1800s, um, English scientists were disparaging tomatoes, saying they're poisonous, they're relations of deadly nightshade, yeah. you shouldn't cook with them. So it's interesting watching these things, these things. I mean, the fork took a long time to get used. And th there's an early description of a fork written by a British writer in the sort of 1700s, and he discovers a fork in an Italian tavern. And uh, he was laughed at in England. People said, that'll never catch It'll on. It'll never catch on. It'll no. never catch on. He also discovered the umbrella, which is quite amazing. So I found these amazing stories, and I sort of put them together in this book. So it's quite fun. No, I I think that that sounds really good. Do, um, when did when did food in Britain stop getting rubbish and start getting good? <laughs> well, there's often a the, the, it's, it's an interesting thing because I think for many hundreds of years, most people in this country have eaten pretty terrible, boring food, and if you look at the food of sort of pre-Victorian and so on, there's a sort of high, the high echelons of society have been doing quite well, and the rest of the society have just been eating pottage, porre, yeah. and basically soup and bread for hundreds of years, for hundreds of years. And then you get, so that the nobles were sort of slaughtering every bird, you know, that they could. Yeah. Feasts were being held for posh people. Yeah. Um, of just quite a horrific proportions, the amount of food being served. So, and there are recipes with sort of fairly dainty recipes, uh, fairly dainty dishes, but you kind of, you get the idea that really that was for very few people. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, if you, if you sort of fast forward to, I mean, if you look at Mrs. Beaton's cookbook, there's some very decent recipes in there, and this is a woman in the Victorian era. Yeah. But um, a couple of world wars rather... Put paid to our development yes. of food, and there's a sort of British instinct which is we'll cope eating blandness because we'll we'll damn well beat the, the foreigner. We'll we'll cook, we'll eat rubbish. 
And that, that rationing mentality existed well into the 70s and 80s and even beyond for certain generations. I think, we, I think the food we eat today is more exciting than ever. The well, plethora I think so. of restaurants and ingredients is just unbelievable. It's not unusual for someone to sort of dole out, you know, bring kimchi, you know, a bit of fermented totally cabbage not. condiment out of their cupboards. You know, you can't go into a provincial town now in England without finding restaurants that represent the cuisines of not just Italy and France, but also Thailand, India, of course. So some people may think we're quite closed-minded in this country, but actually we are the most open-minded when it comes to us welcoming people in and, and absorbing their food culture. So today we are certainly, I think, at the most exciting time in our culinary history because the way that food is transported and the way that food is, is kept and preserved. So... I think now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whereas America, outside the, the the hot the hot inner cities where you know trendy New York and trendy LA and stuff, it's quite hard to eat well in 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 Main Street America, isn't it? I don't have a huge experience of it, but um, I'm shocked by the, the the sort of the chain food you get on these sort of endless, you know, malls. You know, you drive down those long drives, and you've just got all those awful Dunkin' Donut chains. That's, that, I think that's, that's what know. I'm getting at. I've, I've been stuck in places there, like there is a Houston. kind of there, there is a burgeoning independent sector, and people like um, Alice Waters in California and Berkeley. If I say Berkeley, people laugh at you. Where there is a sort of anti-industrialized food movement, people like her have been trying to encourage small suppliers, cutting out the middleman buying direct from farmers, yep. trying to get schools to buy direct from farmers, trying to fight um, the big, big beasts of the food world who are sort of crushing everybody and any flavour and just adding God knows what. Have you been to the hipster restaurant by Oval Tube? Where, this, 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 this seems to me the embodiment of, of, of kind of millennial values in that it's a kind of restaurant which is run as a collective in, a, in one of those kind of live-work unit complexes. And even though theoretically it's open to the public, um, in order to get there, you've got to know somebody who works there. So you can't get into the, to the courtyard where the, where, the, where the restaurant is. And the reason I thought of it is because there is indeed a jar of kimchi on, right. the, on the counter, along with the craft beers, along with the... Um, you know all the sort of uh, the handmade sourdough bread and stuff, and and the hipster beards, and um, but you just can't get to this brilliant place unless you like, really... like whites. Yeah, it is like it is like white hipster whites exactly. Whites, we should explain, is obviously a very elite. Club. Are you a member of whites? I am actually. Are you really? Oh yeah. my god! And wonderful place. Wonderful is it? Is place. it? Yeah, it's great. But, it's uh, great. Uh, it's a it's a properly sort of anachronistic. Uh, appalling thing from the past it's yeah. absolutely fantastic great. men well only got to wear a suit and tie fabulously crusty but the food is great wonderful atmosphere fantastic is it? dining room is the food good really good yeah. I'm so glad because because a lot of London clubs the food's bit... oh their beef their Baclou beef is nothing but, it, but you pay for it I imagine well you'd never get a bill it just goes in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, about three months later money comes out of your account oh, so oh, it feels like it's free is it because I got actually the other the other other um, posher we have done on this podcast is is Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, a not... great friend of mine I'm a huge fan of his and he's a school friend of mine and um, are you contemporaries yeah and uh, godchild to my daughter godfather to my daughter Jacob took boy and me to Boodles right and we had a very good lunch there um, with some really nice claret. That's a second-rate club, a few doors down from White's, I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, but I, I like the fact that the, that the staff were liveried in right in Boodles, and it seemed to have a good, a pretty good ambience. But you're saying it's not as good as White's. Nothing is as good as White's. Oh well, but let's just before before we close, do you share my desire that that Jacob should be prime minister? I love the idea of a friend of mine becoming prime minister. Yeah. Um, and I think that Jacob, whilst I think there's lots of worries around Brexit and in the food world, I'm, I constantly speak to people who are worried, restaurateurs worried, because no one's knocking on their doors wanting jobs. 
Um, no one in no English people seem to want to wait or wash up. Um, all the Brits going to kitchens just want to be celebrity chefs and have Michelin stars. So there's a lot of worry out there, and there's a lot of worry about who's going to pick our strawberries if all the polls go. Um, there's a lot of worry about food pricing. A lot of worry about um, quality because it's all very well saying food will be cheaper, but do we want the welfare standards of how chickens and beef and so on are raised in the United States? Yeah. Now, because I'm very fond of Jacob, I have some trust that he may be able to rescue this 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 um, potential problem. Um, he is very civilized, very generous, very kind, very, very clever. He's a historian. He's a businessman. And um, you can't but love him. So... I think that he would, he he would be a great prime minister. Um, whether it'll happen or not, I don't know. I think he could be. I think there's there's far far worse choices out there. Um, he's very decent and very kind, and I think that's there's a two qualities that are good in a, in a potential William, prime I've minister. William, I've suddenly I've suddenly remembered that at your your last gastronomic evening thing that I attended. Um, there was a sticky moment, <laughs> which was caught over over Jake, Jacob, and I, I'd forgotten that. No, it, there was a big row going on in the dining room. I'd forgotten he was a friend of yours, and when I was making the case, so you must have been sitting there thinking, being amused by it all. But one of your fellow guests had told me that he didn't think that the the country would wear having Jacob Rees Mogg. They'd never elect him because he was a toff and he was too remote. And I was saying, and I said, that's just an I reckon argument. You've just you, just because you think that doesn't mean it's true and you're just advancing it on no evidence whatsoever and actually the ordinary folk love a toff they like somebody like jacob that 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 sort of um that sense of duty that he has and 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 the the common touch and so on and actually you're wrong and i see this in in the chat rooms and stuff i see working class people saying i love jacob rees mogg so i had a, i was having a big row on behalf of your <laughs> defending your friend you know i've i've because he uh, stood for election in various difficult constituencies as yeah. he sort of climbed up the greasy pole before he got his yeah. seat, I, I campaigned for him in every constituency that he fought before he finally became an MP. Right. And people talk about and then they talk about in the media about this sort of toff, aloof toff. When we were on the streets of central Fife, quite a working class district of Scotland, no one... It didn't occur to anyone that he was a toff. They were impressed by the fact that he was out there on the streets taking the arguments to people. You know, he stood on a on a, uh, a chair in the middle of a, the street and started barking through his megaphone. Was it the Chippendale chair that he brought the, with him? Well, no, at, well, it was just it was a bench. Yeah. Um, talking about the tartan tax and so on, and Mad Harry McLeish, who was his then um, opponent. And people liked the fact that he was honest enough to take the argument to them and explain things and debate with them. And uh, and that's always been my experience. And fine, he might have a Bentley and he might have had a nanny. And he might not wash up. And he might not change a nappy. But he he has honest debate and he's got great conviction. You may not believe, and I certainly don't believe in some of his convictions. Um, but... Uh, he's decent and he's also got a very good sense of humour I think it'd be great fun if Jacob was Prime Minister yeah exactly <laughs> um, well I think that's the perfect way to end this brilliant um, and very enjoyable pod podcast so thank you to my incredibly special uber posh guest very <laughs> gast gastronomic guest William Sitwell <laughs> buy his books come to his his posho dinner evenings that even even ordinary folk can, can come to as long as they pay for it yeah, and pay. stay at his Airbnb yeah absolutely stay um, come stay so thank you William um, you're listening to the Daddy Pod Podcast with me James Daddy